Antibodies and Disease, Part 2, Genetics and Structure. Let's have a look first of all then at how cells are able to produce billions and billions of different antibodies. I'm not going to go into this in huge detail, but just give you an overview. The way that this is done is that instead of having a gene that encodes each different antibody, the gene is broken into segments which are then linked together at the DNA level. There are three different loci in the genome that encode antibody chains. First of all, we have two different loci for light chains. We have the locus that encodes lambda light chains and the locus that encodes kappa light chains. Now, functionally, there doesn't seem to be any difference between lambda and kappa. This is simply a way of generating more diversity. The lambda light chains have approximately 30 different variable segments. So these are shown in red. There's a little leader in front of them. Don't worry really about that. What that does is it encodes a signal sequence which allows the antibody to be exported from the cell. Now there are then around about four of these yellow J segments each followed by a C segment. Now what happens is that one of these V segments is chosen at random and coupled with one of these J segments. And the V and the J together form the variable part of the antibody, while the following C segment forms the constant part of the antibody. And we'll see that in structural terms in just a minute. With the kappa light chains, there's a similar sort of arrangement, except that we have around about 40 of these variable segments, followed by five J, or joining segments, and one C segment. So again, we can pick one of these 40 at random, pick one of these five at random, join the two together, and then uh, cut out any remaining J's and join to the C. So again, the V and the J form the variable part of the antibody, and the C forms the constant part. In the heavy chain, we have much the same thing happening again, but we have an extra layer of complexity with the D segments standing for diversity. So we have around about 65 V segments, 27 Ds, and 8 J. So again, we can pick one of these at random, one of these at random, one of these at random, and then we have a series of different constant segments which encode for different constant regions for different types of antibody that have somewhat different functions. For the purpose of antibody-based drugs, essentially we are just interested in the C gamma segment, which produces an IgG antibody. So if we do the maths here, then with the variable, just concentrating on the variable regions, uh, which consist of the variable segments and the joining seg segments, or in the case of the heavy chains, the variable diversity and joining segments, then we have, for lambda chains, about 30 times 4, 120 different lambda chains, for kappa chains, about 40 times 5, so about 200 different kappa chains. And for the heavy chains, we have uh, 65 times 27 times 8. But when the D segment is joined, it can undergo frame shifts and imprecise recombination, uh, leading to addition of extra bases. Uh, and I'm approximately putting in around about 300 times uh, variation from that. So we get about 4.2 million different sequences from doing this.
And if we add all this up, um, then that gives us about 1.3 billion different antibodies. And you'll recall from my slide summarising the role of antibodies in the uh, immunology system that we also have these random mutations being introduced, meaning that we don't just have 1.3 billion because that's the initial antibodies before we start having this somatic hypermutation that gives us uh, enhanced binding through uh, this kind of mini evolutionary process. Let's move on then to antibody structure. You've already seen the overall shape of an antibody, but I think this gives you a little bit of a clearer view. We have these two so-called heavy chains in blue and in yellow, and in natural antibodies, those two chains are identical to one another. And we have the two light chains shown in red, and again, those are identical. This bit at the end is the bit that we're really interested in, because these are the variable domains that give us this huge amount of variation that allows us to bind to different antigens. Whereas this end, uh, this is the constant region which al allows the antibody to interact with the rest of the immune system and trigger downstream effects. Now, depending what we want our antibody-based drug to do, we might want to make mutations in this region to switch off those effects or to enhance them further. Now this is just a, a, a cartoon version of the same thing and here I've labelled these various different protein domains that you saw in the last slide. So the variable ones are labelled as VL and VH, variable light and variable heavy, and those together are known as the FV, the fragment variable, or more commonly the variable fragment. Now one of these complete arms consisting of VL and CL, so this is a constant light chain domain, and in the heavy chain VH and CH1, the first of the constant domains in the heavy chain, this whole arm is known as a FAB fragment, fragment antigen binding. And the stem of the Y shape is known as the FC, that's the fragment crystallizable. Now, this, as we saw in the diagram near the beginning, uh, contains carbohydrates mediating the interaction between the CH2 domains. Uh, there is a disulfide bond within each domain, shown in yellow. Uh, there is also this flexible hinge region here, and that has uh, two disulfides in uh, a typical IgG, but the number varies depending on the particular subclass or class of antibody, whether we have uh, IgGs, IgMs, and so on. Uh, there's also one disulfide which links the light chain to the heavy chain and it's usually the very last residue in the light chain which is a cysteine that binds across to the heavy chain. Now the antigen binding site consists of six loops, three from the heavy chain, three from the light chain at the end of the VH and VL domains. So all the variability is up here. That's what binds to different antigens. The FC fragment is involved in the interactions with the rest of the immune system. Now remember from the genetics that I said we had uh, the V and J segments that come together in the light chain and the V, D and J segments that come together in the heavy chain. So the V and J form the variable light at the protein level, the V, D and J form the variable heavy at the protein level. Each of these individual domains consists of a protein fold known as the immunoglobulin fold. And that's a beta sandwich, so two beta sheets 
one shown in green, one shown in red, forming a sandwich. And the di disulfide that I mentioned links the two sheets together. And this fold is very, very stable. Uh, and that means that you can play with the loops at the end of the fold without having very much impact on the overall structure. And that's exactly what we want to have because that allows us to provide that huge variation in the binding site without damaging the overall structure of the protein. Right, let's start to zoom in on the protein structure to look at a bit more detail. So first of all, I said this is one of the fab arms, the fragment antigen binding. So if we zoom in on this, here we've got one of these fab arms shown in the uh, cyan and blue, and the antigen interacting with this uh, in the kind of greeny yellow. Now, Remember that we had the uh, variable fragments here, uh, the variable fragment consisting of the VH and VL domains. So if we zoom in further onto that region and put the structure upright, we can see the antigen interacting with just the top of this FV fragment. And if we take the space filling off, and look at just the uh, C-alpha trace, the backbone, you can see that there are loops in here in the antibody which are interacting with the antigen. And these are these six hypervariable or complementarity determining region loops that three from, are three from the heavy chain, three from the light chain, that come together to form the binding site. And here I've put those in thicker lines so that you can see them more clearly. In addition, there are these two extra loops um, which are present from a kind of topological perspective of how the protein folds, but those aren't involved in the interactions with the antigen and they're not hypervariable in the way that the other loops are. So if we take this uh, region throw away the antigen at the top, but rotate this towards us, we get an antigen's eye view of what the binding site looks like. And here you can see the six loops in the thick colored lines really very clearly now. And I can space fill those, and you'll see that they form an almost continuous surface. So there are some spaces here which would be filled by residues from the framework that supports the loops. But on the whole, it's a pretty continuous surface uh, formed just from these six loops. And here I'm just labeling those. Uh, we've got the light chain on the right. So we have uh, CDR L1, L2 and L3, H1, H2 and H3. So these three come from the heavy chain. These three come from the light chain. And always we have this orientation and arrangement of the loops such that the third loop falls right in the middle of the binding site. Now, if we look in a bit more detail at these, what I've done here is to show you a sequence alignment of several different antibodies and uh, you can see that there are regions that are quite conserved so here, for example, uh, and here. Uh, but there are regions like here and here which have hugely more diversity. Now, these are the CDR loops. And this was actually first shown back in 1970 by Wu and Kabat, who took a number of antibody sequences, aligned them, and then created a plot of variability. So what we're seeing here is each of the amino acid positions and we're seeing uh, an indication of how variable they are. And they spotted that there were three variable regions um, and there are also, these were sites where there were insertions or deletions occurring. 
And at this stage, nothing was actually known about the structure of an antibody. So they postulated that these hypervariable regions would be loops and that they would form the binding site. And once uh, a structure became available, they were shown to be precisely correct. So uh, this is a, a light chain. So this is the red, green and cyan regions shown here in red, green and cyan in the structure. Now, what's also particularly important about this is that I pointed out a couple of slides back that the arrangement of these CDRs is such that the third hypervariable loop sits in the middle of the binding site. Now, you will recall that from the genetics, I said that we have this splicing of different segments. We start with this uh, leader region, which um, gets cut off from the, uh, the final antibody, but is involved in ensuring that the antibody gets exported from the cell. We then have in the light chain the V and J segments that come together to form the variable domain at the protein level and in the heavy chain we have the V, D and J segments that form the variable domain. Now it turns out that the splice site for V and J correlates with where the CDR L3 is and in the heavy chain the end of the V throughout the whole of the D and the beginning of the J forms the CDR H3. Now that means that we are really focusing the variability because we're getting this splicing, this combination, uh, sort of combinatorial effect, we're really focusing that variation right in the middle of the binding site. And if you think about how you want uh, a protein like this to interact with something else, typically another protein, really having that variability right in the middle is going to be extremely important. And in, of course, in addition to all this, we get this somatic hypermutation giving variability and the genetics is set up such that, once again, we focus the variability into the CDR loops rather than the supporting framework. Now, despite all this huge variability, Cyrus Chodhia, working in the 1980s, showed that the structural variability is rather smaller than you might expect. Now, he only had a fairly small number of structures to look at, uh, around about eight, there are now uh, approximately 3,000 different antibody structures uh, available in the protein data bank. But what he showed, and somewhat surprisingly, this proves still to be the case, is that these loops, despite being hypervariable in sequence, have remarkably conserved structures. So this is CDRL1. And I've shown uh, a number of different structures here of different lengths. So in dark blue, we have one that's 10 residues long. Uh, and in red, I believe that one is 17 residues long. Uh, the yellow one is 11 residues. And what you can see is that if you ignore this little section over on the right here, this kind of rabbit ear that sticks up, the structure of the rest of the loop is remarkably conserved. And so obviously you can't say that the blue one has exactly the same shape as the red one. So the variability seems to depend on, first of all, the length of the CDR. And secondly, the presence of certain key amino acids at particular positions that give the loop its shape. Now, when that work was originally done in the 1980s, as I said, there was a very small number of structures that he looked at. 
the most recent paper that uh, he published uh, on this topic was by Al Lazikani et al., published in 1997, so still some years ago now. Uh, But by this time, there were around about 50 or 60 structures available, and these rules still applied. So here you can see um, maybe three or four different antibodies, uh, antibody loops overlapped from different structures, and you can see that the shape is really very conserved, with a little bit of variation up here. Uh, This is one of these, uh, again, where you can see that this is a longer loop. Uh, So this is, again, CDRL1, as we saw on the previous slide, one of the longer ones, and you can see that the shape is very conserved. So uh, here, uh, this is an example where we've got lots overlapped. And again, obviously, you can see there is some variation, but overall, the shape is very much the same. Now, this is, uh, again, that particular example of a CDRL1. So, um, at this position, uh, if we have an alanine, and at this position we have valine, isoleucine, or leucine, that's V-I-L here, and at this position we have leucine or methionine, L or M, those come together within the loop, and then we have interactions with the surroundings, so we have at position L2 here, an isoleucine, and at position 71, a tyrosine or a phenylalanine. Providing we maintain those residues, then we can play with all these ones in grey as much as we like, and we'll end up with the same essential structure. So we've looked in some detail at antibody structure. Let's go back to a larger level overview and see how antibody fragments could potentially be used as drugs. Now, we've said that this region, the FV, the fragment variable, is the bit that's actually involved in binding to an antigen. And therefore, if all we are interested in is actual binding, so we're not interested in triggering the rest of the immune system, then actually this is all we need. However, by itself, this is not very stable. So we can use a whole FAB, a fab fragment. What we could also do is take this region, but somehow make it more stable. And one of the things we can do to achieve that is a so-called DSFV, where an artificial disulfide is introduced to link the two chains together. The other thing that we can do is known as an SCFV. This is a single-chain FV, where an artificial linker is used to link either the C-terminus of the light chain to the N-terminus of the heavy chain, or vice versa. With these linkers, if we make the linker much shorter, such that it can't span this distance, we can end up producing bivalent antibodies, fragments. So what happens here is that if this linker is too short, we can't achieve the connection within a VH and VL pair, and therefore two of the chains pair up, and this gives us our bivalent antibody. Now if we make that a little bit more complicated and have the VH of antibody A with a short linker to the VL of antibody B, and the VH of antibody B with a short linker to the VL of antibody A, then we can end up with a structure like this, which is not only bivalent, but also bispecific. So we have two different binding sites. This is an example of one of the bivalent antibodies. Uh, This is a single chain FV. These are sometimes also referred to as diabodies. uh, And both ends of this bind to CEA. Now, there are all sorts of variations we can do on that. We can think of um, VH domains by themselves, the single-chain FVs that I've just shown you, uh, FABs. We can produce trivalent, triabodies, tetrabodies, 
This is a normal IgG antibody. Mini bodies where we're just taking um, one pair of constant domains and uh, uh, then single chain FV is attached to it. Uh, the the diabodies bispecific which we've just seen uh, and really all sorts of other things. So this is, this is a fairly old slide. This again is now fairly old but this shows you the kind of things that people were thinking about in 2015. Um, all sorts of different fragments to produce bispecific antibodies. At that stage we're going to take a break again and uh, after the break we're going to look at how we produce antibody-based drugs and our actual kind of research involvement in doing that.